I'll just say he's uh, he's employed by the DNR, Minnesota DNR, and he is uh, currently his position involves coordinating of local governments and other state and federal agencies and and non-government organizations on the Mississippi and Mississippi related uh, issues. He uh, represents the Minnesota DNR in a variety of committees responsible for habitat protection and restoration of the Upper Mississippi and its tributaries. Tim has been a huge resource for the Lake Pepper Legacy Alliance and rely on his uh, back, rely on his uh, knowledge greatly. Thank you, Mike. And okay. And uh, I'd really like to thank Mike and the Lake Pe Pep and Legacy Alliance for setting up this workshop. It's very interesting and uh, Rich for coming from Chesapeake. I heard you speak a few years ago in Dubuque. Um, actually, we've taken a lot of the concepts we learned down there to develop you know, where we are with this process now. Um, and Laura, thanks for setting the stage. Um, you know, the indicators, uh, it's really important is what, what does a TMDL mean to someone that let, loves a river, that recreates on the river and try to put that in into, into something that they can that they can see or touch or feel and it's valuable to them. So when we support things that, that might be expensive, might require changes in the way we do business, that they know that what they might get out of that. And so these indicators really kind of set an important stage for us. Um, um, and I think it's what's really critical is, and what we tried to do with the Citizens Advisory Group is to first understand the linkages between all of these elements. It's amazing how one thing leads to another. And this is just a case model here, just an example. Um, you know, we heard gullies um, are a significant source. They send sediment into our rivers and, and creates turbidity, um, total suspended solids. These things get into our, our backwaters, um, and this turbidity prevents uh, plants from growing, prevents sunlight from penetrating. And we get these large areas that are turbid and have very little, or in some cases, no aquatic vegetation. And we can do things. Um, the TMDL, um, the, the target of trying to reduce sediment in the Minnesota River, um, would reduce this turbidity. We can do other things that have been referenced, like a water level drawdown. We've done this downriver. In the downriver, we have left less ambient turbidity. But the same principles will apply if we can reduce turbidity up here in total suspended solids. We can draw down areas, um, expose those sediments. Um, and then the vegetation will germinate. The, the seeds are out there, and then as the vegetation germinates and reflood it, that vegetation will then collect sediment. It will help clear the water, continuing to expand the amount of vegetation that's out there, and the whole system just kind of resets itself. And once you have the vegetation, you have the wildlife. In this case, it's swans, but it could be muskrats and insects that, that require the vegetation for their life cycle, and the fish that feed on the insects, and the fish that spawn on the vegetation. It's just really essential to the ecosystem. Um, and you see those populations go up. In this case, uh, this is down in Pool 8 uh, by La Crosse where we did, a, we did this drawdown. Um, you can see the swan numbers in red um, really <coughs> increased, and that's because of the vegetation. In the top left corner is arrowhead, and that's what swans feed on. Um, once those numbers go up, people notice. Um, people used to go to Reeks Lake in Pool 4, now they're going to Pool 8. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service built an observation platform. You know, a lot of people come and they're staying down there, they're spending money down there. So there's a real connection between the sediment and what you, um, as a river user, are, are experiencing. So it's not just ecological. There's a social, there's an economic. All this stuff is interconnected and has value to us. So with these indicators, how do we bring the best science available to that? Um, so the process that we followed was fairly simple. We brought in people that, that knew a lot about this. Not everyone, um, but we used a lot of people's work if we didn't involve them. Um, and we brought them together to talk about what are the important metrics. And in other words, for water clarity and for fish, what do we actually measure that we can tell if there's been a change, that we can document an improvement, a meaningful improvement? What do we know about each of those metrics? Historical data or current information? Um, and then can, from those metrics, can we identify a reference condition, something we want to strive for that may be out there now that will help us set targets. And from that process, we're able to uh, set targets, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, technical experts, a lot of them, uh, some of the folks in this room, um, people that have been doing work on the Mississippi, either monitoring or research for a long time. Um, and they're very knowledgeable and they're from a lot of different agencies and organizations, all that have a different role. 
all that collect a little bit of different information, but by bringing them together, we were able to, to pool their knowledge and their thoughts and their data sets. So we created the foundation, and, and, and Norman acknowledged John Sullivan, and I, I just like to also say that I felt like that was some groundbreaking work. Um, what that did was, was show the relationship between total suspended solids, sediment, and aquatic vegetation. And that set the stage for everything else that we did. Um, we have some long-term data programs, long-term resource monitoring program. It's a federal program out of the Environment Management Program managed by the Corps, but administered through USGS and at, at the state level. Um, and then uh, an EPA EMAP program provided a lot of really valuable data. So this chart, it kind of, Norman had something similar to this, but it shows in the blue line on the bottom, that's percent submerged aquatic vegetation. And on the uh, top is the green, which is total suspended solids. And this is from uh, Megan Moore, who does a lot of this sampling. It's fairly, um, uh, there's some fairly recent data and information. I'll, I, I show the graph up to 2006. I'll show this graph again. Uh, but the thing to, to point out here is the dashed line in green is the target, the criteria that Norman mentioned for total suspended solids, and the blue is for submerged aquatic vegetation. They track fairly similarly. When, 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 when total suspended solids are high, submerged aquatic vegetation is low. And remember this, because I'll come back to this. So for each of the, the I'm going to go fairly quickly through each of the indicators and the metrics that were selected, because the technical experts felt like these were the best ways to measure changes. Um, water samples are collected by Met Council um, uh, biweekly at Lock and Dam 2 and 3. That information, some of the information that went into uh, developing the historical and current data sets for total suspended solids, that is also the sampling that will be done to measure changes in the future. In addition, there's Secchi Disk Transparency. It's a very simple, most of you have probably used a Secchi Disk or are familiar with. Black and white disk, you lower in the water, and when it disappears, it tells you how far you can see. Um, that is done um, through our long-term monitoring program bi-weekly uh, during summer bi-monthly during spring and fall up at Pool 4, Lake Pepin. And we also, uh, with the help of the Corps of Engineers, do transparency tubes at the lock, at lock and Dam 3, which can be related to Secchi Disk. So those are two important metrics uh, of information that went into being able to monitor water clarity changes. Aquatic vegetation. Um, we refer to submersed aquatic vegetation. It's the stuff that grows underwater. It's not necessarily the arrowheads and the bulrushes. Um, but the frequency of occurrence is, is very simple. If you go out and sample a location, let's say you take 100 sites that you sample and 20 of them have submerged aquatic vegetation, you have a 20% frequency of occurrence. Uh, species richness is simply the number of species. The more species you have, generally the healthier your system. We strive for more species. And, and those surveys are done in summer. Um, they're done along the main channel border areas. We anticipate trying to take 200 randomly uh, collected samples uh, into the future to be able to measure changes. Sedimentation, um, Dan Ekstrom's going to talk today a lot of the work that they've done um, on sediment rate um, and, uh, in other words, to calculating how long is Lake, is lake Tupman going to exist and what is the amount of sediment coming in to the lake on a given year or over a given time period. It's done through sediment core sampling and he'll talk more about that. That also is very um, critical work to being able to set the stage of total suspended solids. Invertebrates, uh, there's a lot of invertebrates out there. We talked about mayflies, we talked about all kinds of stuff, caddisflies, and kind of settled in on mussels. Mussels, uh, partly because there's a lot of interest and effort being put into mussel monitoring. Uh, mussels are, are a long-lived species, they've been around a long time. Um, they're one of the most endangered and threatened species in the upper Mississippi River. And we felt like, especially in that reach that's so degraded, most of the mussels disappeared uh, years ago when the uh, low oxygen and the conditions are so horrible. Um, but they have, some of them are rebounding now. And so we can measure catch per unit effort of mussels. You go out and you do a dive study in a, in a given location, say 15 minutes, and you catch 15 mussels. That you can, you can determine the number of mussels per minute. And we can set targets on increasing the number of mussels per minute. And we also look at species richness like we do with aquatic vegetation. The more species, the healthier the population. And Laura referenced mucket mussel. Mucket is a species um, once fairly relatively common, um, but it's uh, been extirpated, disappeared from the Sriracha River. Mike Davis, our uh, mussel expert back there, was uh, 
suggested bucket mussels and kind of caught on with everybody. So it's a species that if we improve water quality, improve habitat for mussels, we, we might get them to come back. Fish metrics, fish are interesting. I'm a fisheries biologist by trade and they're always the most challenging to work with other fisheries biologists because there's so many different ways you can do it. Um, but catch per unit effort is how many fish are you catching in a given amount of effort. So you set one net and you catch 20 fish. Um, so you can do that by species or in the case of the, of the citizen stakeholders, um, they really like the concept of fish assemblage. Um, this is a, just a graphic, it's kind of an extreme graphic, but it shows you the concept of a fisheries assemblage where you have a fish community um, on, 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 in, in a fairly degraded system, fewer species dominated by pollution tolerant species, and as you improve habitat and water quality, you start to get into a system that's got species that are more um, intolerant of pollution, uh, greater diversity of species. So you can actually measure through our existing sampling programs um, the amount of, uh, of, of each kind of fish that are out there and you can document changes in the assemblage over time. Uh, we do that through monitoring on pool four, um, eight and 13, and we do comparisons uh, using a variety of different gears. And then we also do electrofishing in the backwaters. Um, we'll continue to do that sampling. Waterfowl, uh, interesting. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, for many years uh, flown in, uh, every week in the fall from about the end of September through December. They fly the refuge, which is Wabasha, down into Iowa. And they do duck counts and swan counts and geese counts. And uh, they uh, uh, have never done any sampling up above uh, Wabasha. So we had almost no waterfall data for this reach of river. And yet historical accounts, people talk about how great the waterfall hunting used to be up in Pool 3 in north of Sturgeon Lake and even in, Sp in Pool 2 in Spring Lake. So um, in large part because of the Citizens Advisory Group saying we want to know more about waterfall, we were able to get together with the right agencies and we now do those counts up in that reach of river. Uh, we haven't set an indicator target yet. We don't know what to expect um, for numbers down the road, uh, but we are collecting that information. And then. Uh, this last uh, indicator is uh, an index. Uh, there's a lot of different indices out there that kind of compile um, a little bit of everything into a number that you can measure a current status and you can see cha measure changes over time. So we, we do qualitative surveys of habitat, water clarity, vegetation, substrates, things like that, and we can measure that change over time. So coming back to this slide, and I'm getting close to the end, um, it, kind of, uh, it, it kind of verifies uh, what what we're talking about, and I thought kind of validates the modeling and work that was done. Um, you know, the last few years, uh, because of low flows, we've actually met the uh, total suspended solids uh, criteria. And we've also seen an increase in aquatic vegetation simultaneously. So if you look at 2006, where you saw a decline in total suspended solids, it was a fairly quick response of aquatic vegetation after that. So. Um, kind of shows that we can, we can, in fact, if we reduce total suspended solids, we can get the vegetation to come back. And we can also use that for other, other things. Um, because we've shown that relationship, we can go to another place that has total suspended solids and submerged vegetation that's similar to our targets. That happens to be Pool 13, uh, which is down by Bellevue, Iowa. And Pool 13 is a pool that's monitored extensively. We've got a lot of data, a lot of information. So we can look at Okay, what are the fish assemblages? Um, what kind of waterfowl use? What other things biologically are occurring down there to kind of look at that as a reference for what we might obtain up here? Um, there's other factors that go into that that's important to know. It's a different part of the river. It's a little different temperatures. The gradients and flows are different, but we can in general use that as a reference, and that's what we did to develop this table. Um, this table, in my mind, is one of the, the most, one of the most significant things that we've been able to, to produce through this particular process anyway. Um, it shows the natural background for each of the indicators. It shows each of the metrics. It shows what the existing conditions are. And then targets. Again, it's based on all those uh, professional um, uh, technical folks getting together and using all this data to develop these targets. Uh, we set up a 10-year target and a 20-year target for the Mississippi makeover and an 8 and a 15 for the TMDL. Whether we achieve that um, in those time frames is yet to be determined, but uh, I think it's consistent with kind of the time frame, Rich, that you, you kind of showed. 
uh, we, we, the citizens group, we debated that a lot, and, and there was an interest in let's let's make this more difficult. Let, we want change to occur. Let's let's not set a 50-year target. Let's set a, a a less than 50-year target and something, and that gives us more motivation to try to achieve that. We also have developed uh, recently a monitoring plan. So we got all these great indicators and these metrics um, until we, unless we track those and determine how they're changing over time, it's not very meaningful to us. So there's a table here of who's doing what. You can see from the lead agency, uh, there's a lot of different entities involved. We do have funding and some of this is ongoing, some of it's not, some of it's gonna require funding um, to continue to do that. So um, my last slide then, so we implement the TMDL. Um, hopefully we are seeing reductions in total suspended solids. And as that is occurring, we can do things within the floodplain itself, uh, like do drawdowns, um, you know, do island building projects and other things. We monitor that over time and then we meet our targets. And we have achieved, and we have achieved um, the vision that we have set for the river. And we have those indicators that the stakeholders determine were important. They see those things, and and uh, and we met that goal. So that's it. Let's take a few questions. Uh, they got us back on time pretty much, and then we'll break for lunch after this. So, uh, any questions there? I'd just like to briefly make a comment uh, that. Uh, I think Tim and Laura kind of are understate, humble, they're humble people and servants of the public, but uh, thinking big, uh, this is big, uh, what has been done here. This is sort of, I think Rich would appreciate, it's kind of very similar to what the goals and the framework that has been established for the Chesapeake Bay Project and goals. And so we have the same quality and depth of research, I think, the same database, the same level of expertise that's gone into that. So that's big that we have that available in Minnesota for the Mississippi River. And uh, it's, it's also, I think, another part of the thinking big is we've done a lot of work uh, to understand where the sediment's coming from, what are the processes, and so forth. So uh, those are two things that we can build on as we go ahead. And as you people locally and elsewhere think about how we can you know, turn uh, turn this TMDL, make it a catalyst for something bigger than just something that's going to sit on a government shelf, something that may actually restore this resource. Uh, we have a lot to build on, and so I, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I appreciate your grasp because I, some of us think different than other people do. That graph you had with the green line going down, and you made the statement that that the that, that, that total suspended solids because of the drier years or the low flow from less rain or something, was that what you made? I, I missed it. Um, yeah, you want me to get the graph back up on Well, the... no, it was there because Norman made some statement about toward the end it had less because, but, because I live in the Blue Earth River area by Fairmont yeah. down there. I live in the friends in town there. But we've been higher in rainfall in the last years. How could the, uh, I'm just trying to patch that to the total suspended solids going down when we really had more rain. Yeah, I mean, locally you may have had more rain on the flows on the Mississippi, though, have been lower than average the last several years. Um, last year they started to change, the change occurred, but there was a period of several years in there where we had lower than normal flows, and, and, and that was reflected in the amount of sediment suspended sediment so but that was uh, kind of a, it was last time we saw that was in the late 80s in the, the last kind of drought period um, and the flows got up total suspended solids got up this time flows went down so there's a relationship and, and Norman showed that in his slide a relationship between the amount of flow and and total suspended solids um, so we just were fortunate the last couple of years to or last few years to have those low low flows creating low total suspended solids and allows us to test the vegetation response, with response, which is what that figure was intended to show. Um, now, it's kind of a different story out there in the river, and who knows, you know, what weather patterns will do now, but, yeah. That didn't have 2010, I don't 
No, that did not have 2010. In 2010, um, that data wasn't available yet, but I think the numbers of flows have gone up and, and we'll see what happens with vegetation. Hi. I'm, I'm sitting here with our mayor and our school board member, and we're talking about how we could incorporate this into a curriculum for our schools. And is there any opportunity as you talk about the testing that you do on the river and the lake in the summer? Is that something that you could take volunteers, perhaps some high school kids along to participate in? Absolutely. We, we try to do as much as we can. Um, it's getting more difficult just because of lower staffing. Um, but we try to, if our schedules work, work with the, the school districts. If they uh, want field day or they want a demonstration, um, a lot of times we're able to get someone there depending on what it, what the, how extensive it is. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, you can get our, our contacts at Lake City. DNR field office has a lot of specialists in a lot of different areas that that uh, we typically are able to uh, to help out the school district. So, come out and help sample. Um, you know, I, we do have sometimes uh, individual students who would kind of tag along, uh, mentor for a day. Uh, they can come out in some cases and watch. It becomes more logistically difficult just because you got to more boats if you're out in the water. Um, to have, you know, if it's a large, large class, that would be kind of tough. Um, but we can certainly do have help when we're doing seining along shorelines, uh, muscle work. Mike does a lot of work with uh, with students and stuff like that. So we'd certainly try to work with you however we could. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I've noticed a couple times in some of the presentations <laughs> where there's been some pictures of the, I think the right word is confluence of the Minnesota River coming into the Mississippi. One of the most vivid impressions I've had received within the last five years or so is that how much of an Im influence the Minnesota River has on the Mississippi. And one thing that's stood out now, especially in the last couple of years, is when they actually take some of the tests in the winter and compare that to summer or high flow uh, periods. I'm wondering if there's any, any kind of uh, reference that can show how much of a recovery there is over the winter compared to when the when the snows start to melt and the and rain start to happen you know when you start to notice that difference so that people can maybe get a little more impression about okay this is what happens this is how good it can be compared to what how bad it does get yeah I, i'm not sure exactly i understand the question in the winter uh, um, typically we have low flow the ground is frozen um, there isn't much runoff occurring, so you you typically see some of your clearest water in the winter, and then as soon as things start to melt and get going, you know, is what you say. But it's comparing winter to winter. I don't know um, that we have. Maybe we do have that information. I'm just not aware of it. Where someone's been monitoring and seeing if we're seeing any changes is in winter. Is that kind of what you were kind of. sort of asking? Kind of. Yeah. Um, kind of. Maybe, maybe if there's someone else in the room that. Uh, knows the answer to that, they can touch base with you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay.